What's going on, everybody? Happy Monday night. I hope you guys are having an absolutely wonderful Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different in this video. What I've done is I've taken all the stuff we've talked about over the last seven or so months, and I've compiled it as people have suggested and I've mentioned I was planning to do into a letter to the board. I'm gonna read through that letter in this video. So it's gonna be a little bit long. What I wanna encourage people to do is provide your feedback in the comments. You know, if there's items you agree with or if you agree with the overall sentiment, awesome. If there's things you wanted to see added, you can mention those too. If there's things you disagree with, go ahead and mention those. If you disagree with the whole letter, that's totally cool too. Whatever your thoughts are. What I can't promise to do is incorporate them. This is a draft at this point, but I will say um, I put my heart into this this morning. I've been working on these thoughts and gathering feedback from you guys for several you know, months here, a long time, several quarters. <laughs> and uh, this, these are my thoughts. I. And you know, I may add a few items here or there, but the general structure I've based off of Ryan Cohen, Michael Burry, and Hestia Capital's letters that came before it. Um, and you know, I will mention on in within the letter that you know there's a large following on this channel, but I want to make clear I don't claim any representation for you guys at all. Uh, that's not what this is about. But um, you know, please do share out your thoughts because I'll mention the video. This is episode 191 specifically so perhaps GameStop's board will read the letter that'd be amazing and perhaps they'll even take the opportunity to read this uh read the comments in this video and watch this video i think that that would be incredible and um, if at some point i get the chance to communicate with the board further i think that that would be absolutely um you know just unbelievable so let's go ahead and read through the letters uh, or letter here and you guys tell me what you think so, you know, I've got the header here, January 16th, 2023. The subject line is maximizing stockholder value by accelerating the tech transformation and delighting customers. I'm just basically reiterating a lot of what Ryan Cohen has already stated with a lot more specifics. So I say, dear members of the board, uh, all these letters always begin with a disclosure of position size. So I kind of had to do the same thing, but it says here that Richard Newton is a stockholder of GameStop Corporation. GameStop are the company with ownership of approximately 11,000 shares of directly registered and beneficially owned com common stock GME and operates a YouTube channel which has an audience collectively owning per surveying at least 3 million shares or of GME or 1% of the outstanding shares of the company. While Richard Newton does not claim to represent in an official capacity the interests of this investor community, the shareholders, or the broader retail community of shareholders, support for the recommendations in this letter can be found throughout the comments section of videos in his YouTube channel, specifically episode 191, Letter to the Board of GameStop. While the transformation of GameStop over the last two years represents a Cinderella story, under the leadership of Ryan Cohen, Matt Furlong, and the new members of the board and executive suite, progress is slow and shareholders are frustrated with the relentless short and distort campaign being waged against the company and the corresponding destruction of shareholder value. 2022 alone saw a 50% decline in the price of GameStop's com common stock. GameStop's leadership should immediately conduct an update to the strategic review put in place in 2021 to revisit the recommendations of past activist inve investors and the recommendations of the current retail shareholder community. This review should include plans to A, expand the capa uh, capabilities of the GameStop wallet and marketplace, B, leverage the GameStop brand, C, optimize the core retail business, D, improve corporate fundamentals, and E, make efforts to aggressively combat the short and distort campaign waged on the company. Per chairman of the board, Ryan Cohen's letter to the board in November 16th, 2020, GameStop needs to, and I've added my own adding like right here, continue to evolve into a Web3 technology company that delights gamers and delivers exceptional digital experiences not remaining a video game retailer that over prioritizes its brick and mortar footprint and stumbles around the online ecosystem. We recognize and hope that the board also recognizes that the greatest changes at GameStop since 2018 have been a result of research, guidance, communication, and eventual follow through by GameStop's board on demands made by activist investors, including Tiger Capital, Hestia and Permanent Capital, Skyon Capital, and RC Ventures. Credit to Kurt Wolf, Hestia Capital, and Permit Capital for the first development of this table in their letter to the board in March of 2020. Additional item, items and changes have been included. So you'll see in this table that back in 2018, Tiger Capital made the following demands on the board, that they launch a strategic review, 
that they revive shareholder confidence, that they pause destructive acquisitions, they divest some core business assets, and they buy back stock. Right after that, GameStop responded by selling Spring Mobile for $700 million. Kurt Wolf, Hestia, and Permit Capital, and John Broderick with a 1.3% stake in the company in 2019 suggested or demanded of the company that they buy back $700 million in stock, that they, they demanded board seats, they demanded a rebuild on the leadership team, that they seek efficiencies in SGNA, and that they sell assets. GameStop responded by uh, announcing an effort to achieve operating profit improvements of $100 million. GameStop appointed Raul Fernandez and Liz Dune to the board. Uh, GameStop announced and completed its Dutch auction buyback of 12 million shares for $62.4 million, and they offloaded their corporate jet. Right after these events, Michael Burry and Skyon Capital, with a 3.3% stake in the company, demanded that the company complete the share buyback program, which still contained $237.6 million. He recommended they do so with elegance and stealth, meaning that they do it at the market without announcement, given the high volume that was occurring on the stock at the time. He noted the incoming console cycle, the short interest being at 63%, and that the share price had continued to be destroyed over the last five years. He noted that the current share price at $3.90, with shares outstanding of 90.2 million shares, uh, gave the company a market cap of $290 million, while they had a cash balance of $480 million. He recommended that um, GameStop effectively leverage its elite position in the gaming universe, and he noted the lack of faith in management by investors. Rather than buying Twitch as an example, they chose to buy wireless store assets instead. So GameStop responded right after this by conducting and completing a share buyback of 22.6 million shares of common stock at an average price of $5.11 per share. Um, and then in September, GameStop replaced, um, sorry, board members purchased almost 97,000 shares of stock, which represented the first purchase by any of the current 11 directors in over nine years. The next year, Kurt Wolf, Hestia Capital, Permit Capital, and John Broderick with now a 7.5% stake in the company. Um, they ended their one-year standstill agreement with the company. They demanded more board seats. They noted the poor board governments, uh, governance of the company. They noted that the board members still lacked uh, like significant degree of share ownership and that share value had declined 85% across the last five years. GameStop responded by adding three new directors and they added, um, so sorry, they had four long-term directors retire. Two additional directors agreed to leave the board the, over the following 16 months and that created three vacancies going into uh, 2020 and 2021. I noted here on the next page that we also recognize that many of the greatest changes at GameStop since 2018 have occurred as, as a direct result of Ryan Cohen's research guidance, communication, and direct leadership of the company as chairman of GameStop's board. Um, Ryan Cohen will be familiar with all of his recommendations or demands to the board over here, but I noted that the company's responses are numerous. There have been new board members, including, including Ryan Cohen and himself. In fact, the entire board is turned over during this time period. There's an entirely new executive suite, including the new CEO, CFO, and COO. Board members have purchased shares of the company in March. They've developed and released the GameStop NFT crypto wallet for Chrome and iPhone, and they've developed and released the GameStop NFT marketplace. They've also entered a strategic partnership with IMX. They've continued their reduction in their retail footprint by over 200 stores since 2020. They've invested into revitalizing legacy systems, fulfillment capacity, inventory, and e-commerce footprint, which is shown by their growth in the e-commerce sales and the expansion of their product catalog, including collectibles, PCs, and PC components. So I note at the end here of this page that with the stated historical demands and responses in perspective, the shareholders rep uh, recommend that GameStop's leadership immediately conduct an update to the strategic review through the consideration of the following items. I note here that the, these items vary from very broad to extremely specific, but all the items represent an opportunity for GameStop to capitalize on its elite position in the gaming universe to accelerate its transformation to a technology company that delights customers with digital experiences while also maximizing shareholder value. So I've broken this up into the five categories noted above. Category A is expanding the capabilities of the GameStop wallet and marketplace. So first for the wallet, I think it's imperative that they go through these 20 improvement steps here, and I'll go through them one by one. Number one, develop and release the Android wallet. Very important. Number two, add two-factor authentication. Number three, 
integrate the wallet with the retail storefront so I can use my wallet to purchase items on the GameStop store. Number four, improve regional support. Too many regions cannot load funds or activate layer two at the moment. Five, improve wallet setup and activation guidance so that new users know how to onboard funds and get their wallet set up. And if they're stuck on a step, you know, prompt them through the follow-up steps. Number six, continue to partner with on-ramp and off-ramp solutions like ramp while providing ease of use. Number seven, improve NFT load times. Number eight, allow users to favorite NFTs that will have priority loading and stick to the top or pin to the top of the wallet. Number nine, prioritize loading NFTs in the currently viewed folder. Number 10, improve the search function so that it includes title, artist, description, and properties. Number 11, add a bulk send option to NFTs so that you can send NFTs to multiple recipients and create contact lists so I can quickly send out to a like already established contact list. Number 12, allow messages to be sent alongside NFTs like you can do on loopring.io. Number 13, have the top menu bar within the wallet stick to the top so that as you scroll through NFTs, it's always up there at the top. Number 14, allow the marketplace to sync so that you can see the last sold price, the highest bid price, or the lowest ask price, or a combination of these, you know, with options as you scroll through your NFTs so you can see if one has gone up or down in value at a glance. Number 15, improve the functionality of the drop-down menus that currently you use to select folders. Right now, they're a little bit glitchy. And then number 16, have those same drop-down menus accessible when you've actually selected an NFT. So when I click on an NFT, I can add it to a folder without going back to the home screen. Number 17, there's a big missed opportunity right now to be advertising within the wallet for items on the GameStop marketplace and items on the GameStop retail storefront and vice versa. So I would encourage cross-platform um, you know, within GameStop marketplace advertising and storefront advertising. Number 18, allow the in-wallet minting of NFTs. And number 19, restore or improve the ability to do in-wallet swapping between cryptocurrencies like it was in place at the beginning. Number 20, create a spam folder that you can turn on that will catch NFTs from unfamiliar or new addresses, just like an email inbox would have. And then from that spam folder, I can move items either to particular folders or just remove them from the spam folder or move them to the hidden folder. For the marketplace, the functionality could be greatly improved and the you know experience more delightful for customers if the iOS and Android marketplaces were accessible. Um, or accessible on those devices. Um, you know, resolve the abundance of NFT loading error issues and loopering collections load error issues that currently exist. A lot of NFTs cannot be viewed currently for, for whatever reason. Have the top bar like with the wallet stick at the top so that as I scroll through NFTs, the top bar is still accessible. Continue to improve the search function like IMX has done to include title, artist, description, and properties. Allow bids creating a full order book like IMX has done with their platform. Um, this is an important one, I think, allowing marketplace users to cross promote content to enter agreements. So for example, if I am a Dungeons and Dragons um, enthusiast that makes art or whatever related to that content, and I have a, you know, a partner that I wanna enter a partnership with, and I can promote their content on my marketplace, you know, storefront on the marketplace. I can enter an agreement to do profit sharing to some degree if users click through from my um, content to theirs, maybe I get 1% of sales or something along those lines, and then create user groups of similar functionality. Number seven, facilitate the trading of NFTs. This will be important for when video games allow trading of in-game items that are NFTs. And then again, allow um, you know via options to quickly see at a glance within the NFT marketplace um, items I own, their last sold price, highest bid price, or lowest ask, ask price. So I can just see the market for my particular NFTs and I don't have to go click into all of my NFTs one by one to see if anything has changed on their current um, pricing. Number nine, again, cross-platform advertisement between the wallet, the marketplace, and the retail storefront. I, I just think it's a lost opportunity to get more engagement across your different platforms. And then number 10, improve the data dashboard so that we can see you know, markets that are moving you know, for NFTs and artists as they're moving um, and just you know, improve the functionality there. Uh, the marketplace content, this is a little bit different than the functionality. Number one, continue to improve, make transparent and expedite the creator application process. There's been big gains here over the last two cycles, but I would like to see it continue to improve and you know, more 
content creators be onboarded each cycle. Number two, for those that have not been onboarded, create an unofficial or unvetted section of the marketplace, sort of like a wild west, to encourage unapproved creators to create content, you know, that's not curated by GameStop, but you know, there's a disclaimer there. And that would allow GameStop um, to easily identify high quality and successful projects, you know, so that when someone applies or even before someone's applied, say, hey, that's a great project, they're doing a great job, they're abiding by community standards and so forth, and then reach out to them and get them added to the marketplace. Number three, improve the toolkit for creators so that they can um, you know, have more functionality. Uh, and you know, I haven't seen the toolkit package specifically, but people have mentioned it's a little bit hard to use and allow for the creation of more advanced NFTs. Finally, number four here is quite complicated, but seek out strategic partnerships like, like what's been done with IMX with gaming to explore, develop, and differentiate on the marketplace and via partner developed apps, the following NFT use cases, art, versus AI art, I think it's very important that these be differentiated for people. Brand promotions, so like what GameStop has recently done with their Power Up promotion, I would like to see companies, you know, partner with GameStop, say Adidas, and if you buy Adidas, you know, real merchandise, then you can correspondingly get Adidas NFTs. Trading cards, um, ticket sales, graphic novels, books, game licenses, so games themselves, game assets for gamers like skins, and then also game assets for game creators like 3D models, textures, et cetera. Uh, Ryan Cohen mentioned in his letter to the board esports, you know, that's a big one to include. Music and albums, as well as audio assets for audio creators like beats and tracks, effects and filters, and so forth. And then we've got down here radio, streaming, video, video assets for video creators, fintech payment processing, crypto swapping, staking, and liquidity pools and tokenized securities. I think what's really important is GameStop doesn't need to take it upon themselves to develop, say, an NFT MP3 player, but find, finding a strategic partnership, you know, to create a well-developed iOS or Android NFT uh, MP3 player, you know, that works super well with the GameStop wallet and marketplace. So I can just, you know, log into that MP3 player with my GameStop wallet and then have access to all my different NFT songs and video. That could be incredibly powerful. Again, GameStop doesn't need to develop it itself, but they need to find partners that are gonna create those solutions for them. And then part B here, leveraging the GameStop brand. I think this is important because GameStop has a legendary brand now and is the elite you know, go-to for gaming, as uh, Michael Burry noted in his letter. Continue to expand and market the GameStop wallet, marketplace, marketplace and pro membership through the NFT exclusives, like what's been done just in the last six months. Expand the pro membership offerings to international, you know, regions, including like what's been done with Germany and Canada recently, but go completely international. Continue to leverage the GameStop brand by converting, for example, Atrix, which I believe is being converted now to GameStop branding. And I would highly encourage GameStop to expand the GameStop line of apparel substantially to include items like casual wear, including more t-shirts and sweaters, socks and underwear, sleepwear, workout attire like gym shorts and uh, uh, basketball shorts and casual business attire, including, you know, subtly branded polos, dress socks, etc. This is a purely selfish endeavor because I wear GameStop wear basically all the time, but I'd like to wear it all the time even more. <laughs> Number four, consider GameStop gaming cafe exclusive locations where cost appropriate to, you know, delight customers in a digital world and introduce them to the, you know, upcoming metaverse and the role of Web3 gaming and the GameStop market, uh, wallet and marketplace in that environment. Part C, optimizing the core retail business. So we're starting to get pretty serious here. The, the first part was focused on the tech transformation. Now we're getting into the core retail business. So expand the e-commerce product availability and region support. For example, I believe it's Miko from Finland cannot access GameStop international shipments. That would be incredible to expand that whenever cost appropriate. Um, I would also just suggest adding a wish list to the on online retail storefront. And then given the you know, inventory constraints and the current macroeconomic circumstances, when items are out of stock, which is quite common, suggest popular alternatives. Number four, this is an incredibly important issue to me personally. The customer service needs to be greatly improved. Online chat on the website right now is not being used, it's broken. It will say that there's no one responding. Phone lines are always busy and care at gamestop.com does not, you do not receive responses through this or if you do, it's 
weeks or months down the line. This is unacceptable. This needs to be fixed now. Number five, allow for in-store returns for items over $500 or create a you know, corporate desk that handles these returns. And this is a must because the catalog, catalog is expanding with PC and PC components like graphics cards. You're gonna see more and more of these returns. They need to be handled timely and efficiently to retain um, and delight customers. D, corporate fundamentals. This is really, really important, right? So number one, make every conceivable effort to return to positive earnings in the immediate future. Cannot emphasize enough. All the other ones will basically support this number one goal. Number two, continue to aggressively cut costs and decrease SG&A by number A or item A here. Close underperforming stores. B, strategically repositioning regional footprints, especially in the current market conditions where, re, where you can see renegotiate leases on beneficial terms given the current like retail sector environment for uh, leases. D, renegotiate vendor prices, again, given the current economic forecast you know, and consumer confidence and so forth. We've got beneficial terms here to leverage. And then E, lower executive and board compensation. I know this is a hard one, with both cash and equity, lower than both, given the economic outlook. Item three, continue to improve cash flow. I believe we were positive cash flow at the last uh, quarterly earnings. It needs to improve to such an extent that we see positive earnings shortly thereafter. Part four, improve revenue wherever possible, but absolutely do not hesitate to cut or sell underperforming assets like, like has been done in the past with Spring Mobile. Number five, maintain and grow the company's cash balance, which will extend the runway into 2025 and beyond. I cannot emphasize this enough. Given this short campaign against the company, extending the runway is incredibly important and maintaining you know, the company's value um, so that you know, should the stock be short attacked like it periodically is, share buybacks are on the table. Number six, be extremely considerate of any acquisitions Avoid using cash reserves for any cash for any acquisitions. Number seven, avoid at all costs a dilution of the outstanding shares of the company unless extraordinary opportunities present themselves to either issue shares at a very high price into the open market, say $100 per, more, per share or more, or use those shares to acquire a business asset that will improve earnings. Very important. That's really the only two considerations that should be going on there. Number eight, Avoid at all costs the issuance of new debt, given the inflationary environment and the high interest rates that currently exist. E, this is the most important section of the document. It's gonna be the longest section as well. I think that the company, the board specifically, needs to make aggressive actions, take aggressive action to combat the short and distort campaign that's being, I'll say, illegally waged against the company. That's important. What's been engaged in by, by parties is illegal, all right? And the company needs to stand up against that because they need to protect the fiduciary um, you know, interests of their shareholders. So this section is gonna be prefaced with three claims. Claim number one, GameStop stock undergoes cyclical run-ups in volumes and price that correspond with monthly option settlement. You can look at the options calendar, look at the trading days plus six, calendar days plus 35, and then trading days plus three. What's going on here is they're deferring options obligations into XRT, which is an ETF run by State Street. And then those option, those obligations come due some days later, resulting in a spike on GameStop um, in volume and price. These are observable and predictable. So what I've got here on this evidence table here is these OPEX tail events. So the board needs to look at these closely. These settlement dates correspond with high fails to deliver. This is public record on these dates immediately following in the T plus two settlement period. And then about 34 trading days later, really on this calendar here, you see those come due, and there's huge price action and volume action on the stock. I can provide additional information upon request. This behavior has been going back since 2012. Okay, These events are now predictable, which is extremely concerning. Claim two, GameStop has historically been and continues to be targeted by price suppression cycles during its quarterly earnings calls and January corporate guidance, as well as their June shareholder meetings. These extend back through 2015 and earlier. These cycles of volumetric events clearly are utilizing off the book locates. This is important, this is illegal. In order to simultaneously sell large volumes of shares naked, suppress the price 
while simultaneously, this is impossible, decreasing short interest, cost to borrow, and utilization. All right, data on all of these can be provided upon request. Beginning in 2018, earnings calls were shifted. This happened in August of 2018. Two weeks later to September and December, causing large volumetric events to still occur but miss earnings. After the market inver inversion in 2020 with the coronavirus rebound, these J-man cycles, as I refer to them on my videos, inverted. Rather than causing price suppression, they still have huge volumetric activity but cause price improvement all the way until August of this past year. Here's evidence of these J-man cycles. You can see the volumetric events by date. You can see when earnings happened or when it missed. And you can see what happened with the stock over here on the right. So I said at the bottom here that these cycles persist back to 2012 and likely earlier. A comprehensive list can be provided upon request if they need it. Of note, these price suppression cycles are now repositioned. So rather than the price being suppressed into uh, March, May, August, and November earnings, you're now seeing the suppression in February, April, June, September, and December to target the current earnings calls. So more uh, information could be provided upon request. But again, during these cycles, price is abruptly crushed with large volume of sell action, which also manages to decrease short interest, cost to borrow, and utilization. That's impossible. But during the inversion events, you're seeing something totally different happen now. So I, I want to be able to talk to the board about this specifically. I think it's incredibly important. Claim number three, GameStop is currently being targeted by a short and distort campaign. Evidence, media allies run negative stories during periods of share price suppression, as well as positive stories during cyclical periods of high volume and share price improvement. Some examples are noted in this table. So in 2018, Sycamore Partners private equity deal ran in a lot of different news publications. All right, this was a short and distort attempt to basically explain why the stock was running up after a shareholder meeting. There was no private equity deal. Notably, they've run the same story against BBBY in the past week, again, mentioning Sycamore Partners. So on this day, you saw a huge volume, 10% increase in price, and then subsequent heavy shorting. Recently, these, have, these relate to the OPEX tail events noted above on the previous page. Leading up to the OPEX tail event in uh, 2022 in January, the Wall Street Journal ran a story about GameStop entering crypto and NFT, and that was an attempt to explain an aftermarket's run, strong run on huge volume. And then just recently on October 28th, leading up into the October 31st OPEX tail run, there was a variety of stories running that S3 Partners was predicting if GameStop went above $30, it would see a parabolic move to the upside. These are concerning because it represents the media telegraphing ahead of time cyclical behavior, meaning that people are in the know and trying to rationalize what's going on in an attempt to obfuscate the cyclical behavior that's going on on the GameStop. It's obvious, All right? With that in consideration, I wanna also mention that there's an additional cycle I haven't mentioned, you know, just to make this short, but there's a, there's a fourth cycle or a third cyclical event that's easily trackable. And if they wanna hear more about it, they can let me know. But with the above considerations, GameStop's board must cease being naive and be proactive and aggressive in preventing the continued destruction of shareholder value being perpetrated by market makers and members of the media and other others. So number one, I would suggest a request for a new designated market maker, DMM, or move GME to another exchange like the NASDAQ. Number two, file formal complaints, lawsuits, or FOIA requests to learn about the nature and extent of short and distort um, with a focus on the selling and shares outstanding in the marketplace. So A, the size of short positions held by institutions and market making participants, including the DTCC and their subsidiaries, the DTC and the NSCC. I wanna know, or GameStop deserves to know and their you know, shareholders deserve to know about the nature and the size of the locate instruments being used to facilitate rampant naked short selling of GameStop stock, GME, whether they're ETFs, options, futures, swaps, tokenized securities, unreported or reported naked short positions, or other exotic derivative products. I think it's also imperative that GameStop learn about the size of long positions held by institutions and beneficiary owners, and proof that the institutions and brokers are holding the corresponding number of shares, 
registered with the DTCC in street name, and that those entries match both the CD and company ledger and the DTC position on computer shares ledger. This is incredibly important. Currently, it seems that the company is diluted by a factor of two to three or more times the outstanding shares, meaning that there are approximately 600 million to over a billion shares existing in the marketplace. That's the only way to explain the behavior of what's going on on the stock. Number three, I feel that the company needs to file formal complaints, lawsuits, and FOIA requests to learn about the way in which the J July 2022 stock dividend split was handled by the DTC and broker dealers. The abrupt termination of many cyclical events, the price collapse, and the decline in short interest, cost to borrow, and utilization, utilization strongly suggests that the dividends distribution of shares was used to bail out large existent naked short selling positions, leaving brokers that currently hold shares beneficially for owners short three dividend shares for every real share or initially share issued. So that means that these shares, these brokers, their balance with the DTC is deficit 75% of their position if they were told to internally split the shares and they did not issue it or receive issuance as a dividend via the DTC from GameStop. Number four, file a formal complaint, lawsuit, or FOIA to learn information about how in January of 2021, broker dealers and market makers conspired with the NSCC to set the stock to position close only, knowing it would crush the price of the stock and devastate shareholder value. All right. Number five, file formal complaints, lawsuits, and FOIA requests to learn about the ways in which FTX and other crypto market makers have used tokenized securities to provide locates to naked short sellers, including market makers and prime brokers. Number six, file again, <laughs> complaints, lawsuits, and FOIA requests to learn about the way in which media corporations, including social media corporations, have deliberately spread misinformation, use terms like MemeStop to you know, degrade the value of the GameStop brand and have surprised GameStop or suppressed GameStop from trending. This includes the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, Yahoo Finance, and Twitter. Shift earnings dates out of the current February, April, June, September, December suppression cycles. Continue to not issue corporate guidance in January or consider issuing that guidance immediately after the quarter four earnings call in March. I have suggested some possible dates that could be extremely advantageous for the company. Those dates are March 20th of this year, May 22nd of this year for the quarter one earnings, August 21st for the quarter two earnings, and November 20th for the December 3rd earning. The rationale for these is they would land them back on the J-Man cycles, which are currently price improvement periods where there's massive share buy-ins, possibly as the locates from previous naked short positions uh, go away. And they're in a period where their position is exposed and they're very vulnerable. This is also important because it's the Monday following monthly option settlement. When ETFs like XRT are at their maximum, forcing them to fail to deliver GameStop as they should if they're going to fail to deliver the stock, which is a whole nother issue that should be talked about. But number eight, increase the amount of funds available to buy back shares. Currently there's $100 million set aside, increase it to half a billion dollars. With an undisclosed target price to be conducted as Michael Burry would say, with elegance and stealth, on the open market, should the price be abruptly deeply shorted as it periodically is currently in these February, April, June, September, December cycles. This historically represents the strongest move that the company has ever been able to make to improve shareholder value, um, both short and long-term, given the nature of the events that have been going on for over eight years. Number nine, prepare to issue into the open market up to 50 million shares without public comment. Again, elegance and stealth. With the undisclosed price target above $100, should the price experience a sudden cyclical volume and price event. This historically represents the second strongest move the company can make to improve shareholder value, which was done in mid-2021, both short and long-term, given the nature of ongoing events. An issuance of 10 million shares alone at $100 per share would improve the company's cash on hand by about a billion dollars, putting short sellers in an unwinnable long-term position while providing the company much-needed capital with which to accelerate its tech transformation. Item 10. 
Issue a crypto or NFT dividend in a similar manner to Overstock.com. Computer Share is the same transfer agent that handled their dividend. Uh, the GameStop wallet is able to be the self-custodial account. And then GameStop's marketplace can act like T0 did to facilitate the trading of the dividend. These dividends could even be periodic, happening monthly or quarterly. Number 11, strongly encourage all board members and executives to continue to demonstrate their commitment and faith in the company, as well as strongly align their interest with the shareholders by aggressively buying back shares of the company at every opportunity. I would recommend during the February, April, June, September, December cycles. <laughs> Seems like the time to buy. Finally, I will conclude this letter by suggesting that the board strongly consider Ryan Cohen's suggestions in his prior letter. In this spirit, we urge you to quickly provide stockholders with a credible and publicly available roadmap for cost containment, prioritizing profitability or profitable retail locations and ge geographic markets and building the e-commerce ecosystem gamers desire. I cannot emphasize this, this enough. This is about, this is over two years later. I would really like to see a roadmap. I really would. Finally, most importantly, I would want to see the company return to profitability and return investor confidence in the entire organization by having the board and C-suite uh, articulating a plan, incorporate share, incorporating shareholder feedback and being both proactive and aggressive to protect the interests of shareholders. And as Ryan Cohn noted in his recent interview with GME DD, every detail matters. So with that, I'm going to end the video there. Please, again, let me know your thoughts whether you agree with the letter, what uh, items you may agree or disagree with. Again, I'm not claiming to represent anybody but myself, but I feel that through feedback and discussions that have been ongoing through the last 191 videos on this channel and the last seven or eight years together as we've you know, endured this incredible struggle, um, you know, I feel like this letter gives voice to a lot of issues that have been brought up over those last months and quarters. So with that, I hope you guys have a wonderful night and I'll see you guys in the next one.